will enter his gates with praise. Will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will sing his symphony that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. Gracious Father, we thank you that nothing is difficult for you, nothing is hard. You are God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, creator of all things, and we are beholden to you, Lord, for every breath and every good thing. And we praise your holy name this morning. We pray that you truly be glorified in this place today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Welcome in Jesus' name. You can be seated. Welcome to everybody listening uh, on the radio and online and on Facebook and stuff. Got a few announcements for you. Uh, part of the service this morning, we're going to have a community together. Looking forward to that. And then uh, this week, uh, on Tuesday, the men's Bible study resumes. We took a couple weeks off uh, for the holidays, but to get back at it this Tuesday. It starts at uh, 6 o'clock here at church, and uh, looking forward to having the guys back. And then uh, Thursday, the 6th, the ladies' study resumes, and that will take place here at church uh, for those that want to come in person. And then also... Uh, Kind of something a little new for us, but we're going to try it and uh, present the women's study on a Zoom uh, format as well. And so some of the ladies that can't get here because of weather or ice or different things uh, can watch or basically participate on Zoom. The thing is, though, you got to get a hold of Grace, and uh, she'll give you. A, the, the, there's a code you get from Zoom that you know you can email back and forth on that stuff, and uh, you have to make arrangements for it. You can't just kind of jump in uh, without 
the right, I guess, uh, information. So uh, if you want to do that, then, then get a hold of Grace, or if you're listening on the radio or on Facebook, you get a hold of Grace, and uh, she'll, she'll get squared away on that. And then uh, on January 15th is the, uh, that's uh, Thursday next, uh, not next, one after that. Anyway, uh, the Single Women's Fellowship Dinner will be here at church at 4 o'clock, and there's a sign up on the counter for that. And I guess the ladies have a pretty good time when they get together. And then uh, we've got the uh, Saturday FMO uh, coming up on the 22nd. We'll start that again. Looking forward to being with the men. And I encourage you guys all to come out to that. Again, there's a sign up on the counter for that. And then later that day on Saturday the 22nd, we have our annual uh, March for Life. Uh, that starts at 11 o'clock. Uh, we gather at the Lassen Shopping Center. And essentially, we, after we gather together and pray, uh, we walk up Main Street, cross the street, come back down. And it takes about an hour or so, you know, give or take to do that. And what we're trying to do is uh, it commemorates the, the anniversary of Roe versus Wade, uh, which is a terrible decision by our Supreme Court back in that day that's allowed for uh, the abortion industry to prosper and the murder of many uh, millions of children since then. Uh, and so we're trying to make our community aware of that. And so we, uh, we, we pray, we, we've got some uh, placards that we carry and stuff, a few of us, and, uh, and we just work our way up and down Main Street and people wave at you this way or they wave at you some other way. Uh, but either way, they, uh, they acknowledge that we're there and they're made more aware of the issue in general. And so uh, it's a really good thing. And it's really kind of in support of Mama's Ministry next door to us that we very much support. And, uh, you know, I think last year, I don't have the stats for this year, but last year, if I recall correctly, uh, according to Leah, uh, there were 23 women uh, that uh, the ministry helped to keep from having abortion. So there's 23 babies that are alive today. <laughs> Uh, because of the ministry next door to us. And so it's a valuable ministry, and I think it's a valuable, it's an important issue to raise uh, in our community uh, because people take those things honestly for granted. And so uh, I think it's an important thing to, to highlight. So if you can, uh, come out with us uh, on the 22nd, and, uh, and uh, we'll walk up and down the street and, uh, and pray and praise the Lord along the way. Father God, thank you so much for bringing us here today. Uh, thank you for your love and your kindness and your faithfulness. Help us this day to honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue to worship. Praise, God be praised. 
Stand with me. We'll sing this uh, just as I am. One of my favorite communion songs is just, just as I am. 
of right. Well, I don't have to get right. I don't have to be perfect. He'll just take me as I go. And then if we'll just take it as it comes, commit to Christ and take it as it comes, ah, he'll heal us, he'll deliver us, he'll rescue us, he'll save us. Here we go. Just as I am Gracious Father, we thank you for receiving us the way we are, Lord, but we thank you as well for not leaving us in that state, for helping us, Lord, to be different, to be better, Lord, to be cleansed by the blood of the Lamb and to walk in your ways. We thank you, Lord, for your redeeming work in our hearts and our lives, and we rejoice in you that we have our names written in the Lamb's book of life, and we can hardly wait to be with you, Lord. Guide us until then. Guide us, Lord, by your Spirit, and help us to please you today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, welcome to Jesus' name. Why don't you kind of say hello to somebody? Hey, Kevin.
All right. Well, it's time to pray for any of the kids are going off to nursery or maybe Sunday school. It looks like mostly nursery. But uh, I say, or for the ones who are staying here. Father God, we thank you for the kids that are here today, Lord, and we ask that you would bless them, that you would minister to the ones that are going to the nursery, and that you would speak to their hearts, Lord. Even these precious little ones that can barely talk, Lord, that they can hear your voice, Lord, they can understand that there's a, a Father, a God in heaven that loves them, and has given his life for them. And so bless your kids today, Father, and bless those you minister to them. May they simply reflect your love and joy to these kids. And have your way, Lord, we submit to you, Lord. In Jesus' name. I hate to leave the sanctuary, too. <laughs> hey, this morning we're going to continue our study uh, through Revelation and, and the, the letter to uh, the church in Ephesus. And so we'll be in Revelation chapter 2, and uh, we won't quite get through it because we're going to have communion towards the end of the service. But I'd like to read the chapter together, then we'll get back and we'll, we'll study it through. So once you get your Bibles open to Revelation chapter 2, uh, if you're able, would you stand with me? In, uh, in reverence for God's word as we read it together. Revelation chapter 2, beginning now at verse 1, it says, To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say that they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I'll come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And to the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last who was dead and, and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer, Indeed, the devil's about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. And to the angel of the church of Pergamos write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell and where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. And to the angel of the church of Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience, and as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. 
Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. And now I say to you, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, and I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works till the end, uh, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. Uh, they shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as, also, as I also have received from my father. And I will give them the morning star. I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Gracious Father, we ask that by your Spirit that you would help us to have ears to hear today. That we would be able to, to hear what you say, Lord, and to receive it into our hearts. And to learn the lessons that you want to teach us. So guide us, Lord, by your Spirit. And help us very much, Lord, to hear your voice today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. You guys can be seated. Well, we're uh, kind of in the middle of, uh, not quite the absolute middle, but we're, we're examining the letter to the church in Ephesus. And I put up a, a map behind me with an arrow pointing to the city of Ephesus. You can see that it's kind of a, on the uh, Ionian Sea uh, there, or the Aegean Sea. Uh, and then Asia kind of stretches out behind it. It's a port city. Uh, it's, a, it's a desolate place today. It's uh, actually in, in Turkey. It's a place called Izmir. And uh, basically, it's ruins. Uh, people go by, tourists come in there to, to look at it, the old church that was there, that kind of thing. Uh, but there's no real activity there apart from people just looky-looing uh, and visiting uh, to see what happened there. Because apparently, they did not take heed uh, to the word of God and to the admonition that Jesus had given them. I pray that we'll be smarter than that, uh, that we'll take heed to what God has spoken, and that uh, we'll learn those lessons and keep moving on and, and be his church. We're going to pick it up here in verse 3 where it says, And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. One of the things in Christianity that you learn as you, as you become a Christian and as you begin to kind of live the Christian life, endurance is a real factor, being able to persevere. Uh, as, a, as a new Christian about 35 years ago or so, uh, I was mentored by a lot of guys, a lot of people spoke into my life. I was around a lot of good Christian people that really encouraged me in God's ways. But over the years, I've seen many of those people just fall away from the Lord. Many of those people have kind of disappeared and, in a sense, stopped running the race. And you know what? Uh, if you quit, there's no prize at the end, you know, if you, if you, if you stop short. And so we're all encouraged to keep going, to, to keep moving. And here they're commended uh, for their perseverance, for their not giving up. And God is paying attention. Uh, we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, it says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And so to be steadfast, unmovable, abounding in his work, to keep moving forward. The writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, he says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Christianity is not a 50-yard dash. It's more like a marathon. You know, you just kind of keep going. I, I remember back in high school, uh, about 100 pounds ago, when I was on the uh, cross-country team. And we would run basically uh, 10 miles a day uh, so we could run a two-mile race, you know, uh, at the end of the month. And we would train and train and train. And I remember uh, a lot of times we did our, our, our cross-country races. There were basically two miles. And we'd go to Cal State Long Beach, and they had a pretty big campus. And so we'd start off one part of the campus, and it was really hilly and stuff. We'd be running around, and, and, but the end of every race would always end in the, the football stadium. You'd go through a, a tunnel you know, into the, uh, uh, the stadium. And then as you got into the tunnel, you could hear the people cheering. Now, the stadium was never all that full. There were maybe a couple hundred people there when you run the cross country you know, uh, tr race. But, um, but you'd hear the people. And so you know, in the middle of the race, you'd be running, you'd be out of breath. You're, not, you're trying to time it. You, know, you want to give as much energy as you can, but not weigh yourself out the one-mile mark or the half-mile mark or whatever. You know. And so you're running, you're running, and you're, all these thoughts are going through your head, and, you know, and you're trying to you know, 
just focus on you know getting there and as fast as you could. But every single time you came into that that last part where you come through that tunnel, and then you you, you go through this tunnel and come out into the stadium, and there's the crowd, all 200 people, you know, and they're yelling and they're cheering and all kind. Of, and every single time, I don't know, every single time you come into that that part of it, and all of a sudden you, you thought you were going to die before you got there, right? And you come through that tunnel, and boom, you had so much energy and a kick, and you just keep going, and you run, run that track. You know, and you get to the finish line, you just don't want to collapse, you know, because you just gave everything. But the, the idea is that there's all these witnesses. There's all these people watching and cheering. That's not the place to fall down and, you know, go fetal and suck your thumb. Oh, I can't run anymore. You know, <laughs> that's not the place to give up. And what we're being told is that we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And, you know, and whether it's believers or non-believers or it's the angels in heaven or our Lord himself, people and our Lord are watching. And we've got to be prepared to go the distance. We've got to be prepared to hit the finish line because there's no prize for quitting. And so we, you know, endurance really counts. And so they're being commended, if you will, uh, for their perseverance. The church in Ephesus, they had a, a zeal and a steadfastness in the name of Jesus Christ that resulted in the spreading of the gospel all over Asia. That map that I showed you, every, every part of that was influenced uh, by, by the gospel, by the witness of the church. And, and they're being commended for that. Paul was in Ephesus teaching and reasoning in the school of Tyrannus, which was a, a big school at the time, but it had a huge impact on the surrounding area. In Acts chapter 19, uh, verse 10, it says, and this continued for two years so that all who dwelt in Asia, that's a pretty big place, all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. I mean, that's, a, that's a pretty big influence. In verse 26, it goes on to say, moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that they are not gods which were made with hands. Paul's influence was so great uh, from the church of Ephesus that a lot of pagans, a lot of non-believers turned away from their false gods to the true and the living God. But it was partly the, the, the influence of the church there in Ephesus. It was a big deal and, and very successful from a, a spiritual standpoint, very successful from an evangelistic standpoint. And that the gospel went out greatly, you know, from this group of believers. And, you know, the, the church in Ephesus was a working church. You know, in labor, they did not faint or become weary. They endured hardships. And quite honestly, we need to be able to endure hardship. You know, the church in America is more toward the Laodicean kind of thing, that we're self-sufficient, we're fat, dumb, and lazy. We're ignorant of God's word, and we're not doing a lot. And uh, and I think that, you know, if we want to stay alive, we, we got to keep getting out there and sharing with people and living our lives, you know, for Jesus and, and, and doing what we can to, to further the gospel. And so that's what Ephesus was doing. And, you know, Jesus told his disciples in Matthew chapter 10, verse 22, he said, and you, and, and you will be hated by all for my namesake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. And so we've got to endure to the end. It's not that you started off great, you know, and then gave up. That's not going to do us any good. And even if we didn't start off all that good, sometimes, you know, you get better as you go. And by the grace of God, you make it to the end. And that's our desire, that we want to make it to the end of the race. We read in Acts chapter 14, uh, verses 21 and 22, it says, And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned uh, to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to, to, to continue in the faith, and saying we must do... We, we must do many tribulations enter into the kingdom of God. I think that there, 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 uh, rightly there should be an, a, 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 um, an emphasis on evangelism. We should get out there and, and share the gospel. That is, I don't want to take away from that. But at the same time, we need to, as a, as a body of believers, as individuals, be encouraging each other. One of the, the spiritual gifts I think that God has given me has been the gift of exhortation. In other words, you, you find believers that are, you know, sometimes being a Christian is not easy, is it? I mean, it's not always a bed of roses. Sometimes there's hardship that comes with that. I mean, the end is great and glorious, and we look forward to that. But in, and in the meantime, there is joy. There's awesome things that take place, and, and, and you, you, you praise the Lord for the great things he's doing. But there, there are hard things that happen sometimes in the meantime, and Christians can get discouraged. And I think it's just as important to encourage discouraged Christians 
as much as it is to reach out to new people and get them to, you know, to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. And Paul and team did that. They went through these different churches and they encouraged the believers because they're being persecuted. There's things that are happening. And, you know, even in our world today, you know, it used to be, oh, you're a Christian. You know, thumbs up. That's a good thing. But more and more today, when they find out you're a Christian, oh, you're one of them. You know, you're the problem uh, kind of a mentality. And Christians are being attacked more and more and more and their faith and stuff. And it's like the whole world is upside down right now. And so we should expect some of those hardships and that we're going to have to kind of press through some of those things and not just, you know, lay down and give up. And so the exhortation is to continue. You know, they had a mindset. And I want to have that mindset that, in a sense, that I will not be moved. You know, I believe certain things to be true. I know that Jesus is God. I know that his word is true. I know that my God loves me. And, and there's certain things that I know, things that I know from the Bible that I will not be moved from. And when they say, well, where's your God? Or they sneer or they say, you know, crude things or whatever. So that's not going to move me. That doesn't intimidate me a little, even a little bit. We've got to have that kind of steadfast kind of mentality. I, my wife... Uh, she, somebody sent her this meme, and she sent it to me. I thought it was pretty cool. And it's got this cool picture, but it's got two words on it. The first word is grace, and then the next word underneath that is grit. And, you know, the, the church is real good about teaching about grace. And it, the, the meme was kind of directed to men. That You know, the, a lot of men know a lot about grace and the grace of God, and, and we should. But not enough men know about the grit of God, the steadfastness of God, the, the, the toughness of our God that we need to emulate at times. Because people are going to be coming against us and coming against our faith and coming against our Jesus. And if we just wither like a, like a lily, we're done. What good does that do? We've got to have a little bit of grit. And, and part of that is the, the fighting spirit of God, in my mind anyway. Uh, you know, I know that my God is gentle and he's loving his kind, but he's also a warrior God. He's also a God that smotes people, you know. And I don't want to go around just, you know, arbitrarily smoting people. I've got a list that I've got to put away. But, I mean, you know, <laughs> but, but we, we, we have to have that kind of a, a mental toughness, grit, to get through this life. You know, if, you, if you're too thin-skinned and too sensitive about stuff, you'll just end up on the floor sucking your thumb somewhere. You know, and that's not what we're called to do. We're, we're called to stand for our Lord and to have that steadfastness. And, and the church in Ephesus is being commended for that because it didn't just roll over. I remember back, you know, just a chapter ago when John the Apostle introduced himself as the, the author of this book. And in Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, uh, he said, uh, I, John, who also am your, your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom of the patience of Jesus Christ. But he goes, you know, Christianity hasn't been an easy walk for me. I mean, how did he end up on an island of Patmos to write this book? He got boiled in oil first. <laughs> You know, he was, he was persecuted, and, and I'm sure other things that happened. But it reminds me of what our, the Apostle Paul wrote. You know, the Holy Spirit guided him in Romans chapter 8, verses 35 and forward. He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor debt, uh, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I will not be moved. And, and I'm trusting in the word of God. I'm trusting in the spirit of God. I, I, you know, I read God's word. I know what his plan is. And so I'm just waiting for that plan to be fulfilled. And so, so I'm, I'm going to trust him. I'm going to wait on him. And sometimes that's the hardest thing to do, isn't it? Waiting on the Lord to move or do something. You want it to happen faster. But in his good time, he'll do it. And so we trust him. So they're commended for actually a, a number of good things. Uh, we read between chapters 2, I mean, uh, verses 2 and 3. I, I know your works, the things that you're doing. I know your labor, the effort that you've put into it. I know your patience that you're waiting for me. Uh, I know that you've not tolerated wicked men. You know that you've uh, tested them to find out who they are, what they're about, and, and what they're up to. Uh, I know that you've persevered. Uh, you know, you've, you've borne and endured hardships and persecution. And then finally, I know that you've uh, not fainted. You didn't grow weary. You didn't just, you know, I, I, 
I, I see people all the time that one little bit of opposition, it's like, oh, you know, and they don't know what to do. They get all woke and stuff, you know, and it's like, come on. You know, uh, we, we've got we've to have some of that grit. And they've demonstrated that. That's pretty cool. But we get to verse 4, and the very first word is nevertheless. And, and, and what that makes me think of is, you know, he's, he's made it a point to commend them. He's made seven points of commendation. And, and now, you know, and I think any good leader, any good supervisor, uh, any, any good leader just in general, when you've got to deal with a subordinate and you're going to sit them down, you're going to talk about something, you know, you shouldn't just look at their, quote, unquote, negative or poor performance. You can point that out pretty easily. But, you know, you've got to evaluate the whole package. And so he's doing that. He's saying, you know, you've done this right and this right and this right. You're doing several things right. But as any good supervisor would know, You've got to be honest with them. I, when I do discipleship with men and, and, and younger men, I, I try to encourage them in the things of the Lord, but I would be dishonest or hypocritical if I didn't at times, at the same time, say, well, you know, you're doing these things right. It's really good. I want to encourage you in that. But, you know, you really got to lay off this or that or make a correction or whatever. That's part of trying to help that individual improve in an overall way because if you just gloss over stuff and ignore stuff, it's not – good enough that they're doing a few good things, but they're doing a bunch of bad things too. You know, you want to you help them improve their performance. And sometimes we need the Holy Spirit to re reprove us. We need the Holy Spirit to rebuke us. We need the Holy Spirit to, to reveal things. And so often, I'll, I'll be honest with you, when I do have to talk to somebody about difficult things like this, my prayer is that when I do eventually talk to somebody, I'm not, I'm not breaking like a news flash to them. I'm praying that when I talk to them about something, they're going to say something along the lines of, yeah, the Lord's been speaking to me about that, <laughs> you know, or, or, you know, I want to be confirmation of what the Lord's already doing. And I think that's what's happening here as well. I, my guess is, and I, I can't say thus say it the Lord, but I would bet that if you could talk to those leaders in the Ephesian church back in the day, and as Jesus gets to the point where he's saying, nevertheless, I have this against you, you've left your first love. I would imagine if we had a chance to talk to them before they got the letter, or when they got the letter, they go, yeah, the Holy Spirit's been speaking that to my heart for a season now, and I just haven't you know, done anything. About it. I've had that happen. I've been thinking about stuff and thinking about stuff and go, man, i got to fix this or I stop doing that or whatever. You know, i got to make a, a correction of my own walk, and then I get a, a, a person that comes to me or I hear a scripture from a, a study on the radio or I'm doing my devotions, and bam, you know, the Lord just smacks me, you know. And it's like, he'd already put it on my heart, but now he's up in the ante a little bit, and he's bringing someone else to give that same message. And so I don't think that as the Ephesians got this letter, or the church in Smyrna, or the other churches, when they got these things, it was like a gigantic, oh, no, I never saw that before. <laughs> I think that this is just one of those final kind of warnings on the subject to, to straighten up and fly right. And so I think it's really awesome that our, you know, when I was looking for a, a model for leadership, because when I was a sergeant at the PD, they sent me to leadership schools and sergeant school and all these different things trying to help you be a good sergeant. And I was amazed at the stuff that they exposed me to. It was stupid. A lot of it was very foolish. It was, it was worldly, secular, psychological, all kinds of stuff. But I'm reading the Bible, and I see my Lord Jesus is a really good supervisor. <laughs> you know, he, he commends his troops for doing good. And then he turns right around and says, hey, and here's what you need to fix. That's, that's good leadership. And we see that our Lord Jesus is doing just that. He says, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you've left your first love. And so the first thing I kind of catch is, I have this against you. If Jesus holds anything against them or even against us, it's because we haven't asked him to forgive us for it. I mean, the Bible tells us in 1 John 1, 9, he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness. And so if we do that, if we, as we're aware of our sins, we say, Lord Jesus, will you forgive me? Then he doesn't have anything against us. So if he's got something against us, this I have against you, it's because they haven't confessed it. They haven't asked him to forgive him, forgive them for it. And sometimes, I'll be honest with you, I mean, I'm oblivious to some of my sins. I just, I'm like a bull in a china shop. I'm just blazing through, living my life with a big grin on my face, and I'm just oblivious. But every now and then I slow down, and I go, Lord, am I doing okay? And he goes, well, hang on a second, bud. <laughs> I got to talk about this and this and this and this. You know, Ephesus gets rebuked for one thing. I get rebuked for 12, you know. But, but the thing is, if we ask, he'll reveal it. If, if we say, Lord, search my heart and try me and see if there's any wicked way in me. 
you know, when you pray that prayer, and I, and I really encourage you to pray that prayer, but put on your seatbelt and put a box of Band-Aids next to your chair because <laughs> hang on for the ride and he's going to show you and, and he's going to reveal some stuff. And, and praise God that he does because I want to live my life in a way that's pleasing to him. I want to live my life in a way that I don't have the, the burden of sin or anything would hinder me in my relationship with him. And so even though it's not always a pleasant process, it's a process that there's great benefit. And so we need to engage in that. And so, he, you know, I have this against you. And then he says that you've left your first love. Somehow or another, they, they had left or forsaken their first love, and it sounds like an act of the will. When you leave something, I mean, you could be forgetful, leave your keys at church or your Bible or something like that. And people do that from time to time. It's not on purpose. They do that kind of stuff. But it's something that they did anyway out of negligence or whatever. And, um, and, and it, but it sounds like an act of the will. It's a series of choices or decisions that result in a, a, a drifting away. And sometimes, I don't think people just say, you know, they flip a switch. Ah, I'm going to forsake God today and go live my own life. They don't, I, no one I've ever talked to has done that. They don't just turn on a dime and go, forget you, God. It usually starts with a series of choices, little things at first, maybe bigger things, and it grows after a while, and pretty quick you look back and go, ah, where's God? You know, and it's more like, no, where am I? And, and that's the real point here, because he says there, you have left your first love. Not I left you, you left me. And it's understanding who did what. You know, we're the ones who move. God is always the same. God is steadfast. I love that. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In Hebrews 13, uh, verse 5, it says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so if, uh, if somehow we've left our first love, it's not God that moved, it's us. In fact, he tells us in verse 8 that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. And so uh, that word left is interesting. It's, uh, in the Greek, it's aphemai. And it means to let go from oneself, to dismiss, or it's used in uh, putting away a wife. Like a man divorces his wife, he puts her away. That's not an accident. I woke up yesterday and I was divorced. No way. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's like some guys are surprised because they get the letter in the mail. But I mean, it's usually an act. Someone made a choice. And, and, and that's what happens here. And, and at the least, they allowed other things to take precedence in their lives. And we've got to be careful against that. And he says in the last part of verse 4, uh, you, you left your first love. Our, our, our first love who is to be first in everything, foremost in our lives, the highest priority that we have, our primary love, our prime objective, the most important thing in our lives. And, um, and you know, Jesus tells us in, in Matthew twenty two thirty seven, 37, he said, uh, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and, and with all your soul. And so we're called to love him supremely. He tells us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these other things will be added unto you. But it, it speaks of the, the, our Lord Jesus being the most important relationship in our lives. Too many Christians live what I would refer to as kind of a nominal Christian life. They, they like being a Christian. They like the idea that they're saved, that kind of stuff. But they kind of squeeze God in where they can where it's convenient or whatever. If they don't have something better, else, better going on, on Sunday, then they'll show up at church or whatever. You know, and you know, they, they, they kind of live their lives and squeeze God in where they, they're able to. Whereas I think that the life that our Lord would have us to live, if we're seeking him first in his kingdom, if we're loving him supremely with all of our heart and all of our strength and all of our soul, then we're going to live for Jesus. Then we're going to squeeze life in around that, that he becomes that first priority. You know, uh, for some people, it's not a question of when they'll, they'll go to church. They just do because that's part of their life. They love their Lord so much. They want to be there. Other people kind of, well, you know, there's a baseball game or football's on or whatever, you know, and, and they, they gauge things that way. It shouldn't even be a choice in a certain sense that we want to honor God with everything that we have. Our love for Jesus has to take precedence over every other relationship, every other desire, every other thing in our lives. And I know it's a high standard, but what do you expect with an awesome God? He doesn't set low standards. He, now, he does set standards we're able to achieve, but they're high in that, in that sense. Jesus even says in, in Luke chapter 14, verse 26, if anyone comes to me 
does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. A lot of people have a hard time with that verse because, you know, I love my wife and I love my kids. And, uh, and, and, and he says, there, man, uh, I have to, to hate them? No. What he's, what he's saying is that our love for Jesus has to be so great, so big, so incredible that in comparison to the love that we have for our wives and our kids, it would seem like hatred. But it's the idea that we love him supremely. And what I found is that when I do love him supremely, when I make him the, the most important thing in my life, the focal point of my life, I find myself loving my wife more and loving my kids more and loving you guys more and, and people that I'm around more because that love for him permeates my life and my heart and I treat people differently. I know lots of cops and firemen and guards that, that work at hard jobs and, and, and it's the kind of job, honestly, that you can easily develop a hatred for people. And I've seen lots of guys totally give in to that and it's a hard thing to watch because it, it's, a, it's a ruined life. They think that the, the guy's wearing a white hat, doing a good job, and they're, they're, they're hating people that God loves. And I, what I found, though, that as Christians, when, when men and women come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, he does something in their hearts. And he begins to peel that back like layers of an onion. And it, it was a process with me, and it's a process with every person that goes through the same thing. But you, you find yourself in that place of loving more than hating. You find yourself as he, as he impacts our hearts and our lives that we are different people because of him and he changes us from the inside out. But we're, we're called to that. And, and, but we're called to love him supremely and if we do that, even if you're the most hardened person you can think of, you'll begin to soften. That heart will begin to melt and, and, and God will give you a, take out the heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh. And I know because I was there. I mean, I remember watching guys die and eating a bologna sandwich, kind of going, can you hurry up? I got to go. I mean, I had a hard heart. Like, I mean, and I still have a hard heart, but I mean, it's not as hard as it used to be. But God can do that transformative work. But the idea is that we have to love him first, and he'll do that in us. Our love for Jesus needs to be so great as to make our love for others seem like hatred in comparison. And when you look at that phrase, you know, your first love, our first love has to be Jesus, seeking to please him. That is our purpose in life. A lot of people struggle with, you know, what's my value? What's my, my reason for being here? You know, what's the meaning of life? And uh, we get the meaning of life from God's word. God gives us meaning and purpose in our lives. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, here uh, we read, we'll read it in a few more weeks. Uh, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you have created all things, and for your pleasure they are and were created. What that means is that we were created for his good pleasure, to please him. Our purpose in life is to be pleasing to God. Well, how do we do that? Well, the Bible tells us that if we're obedient to his word, that's pleasing to him. That, that if we have his commandments and do his commandments, then that's love. Jesus equates that to love. And so our job is to be obedient to his word and to love him on his terms. You know, um, our prime objective should overrule everything else that we do. Paul writes to the Colossians under the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Our purpose in life is simply to be pleasing to God. And so we study God's word to find out, well, what is pleasing to God? As we'll read here in a few minutes, there's things that God hates things that he says are an abomination or whatever, and you go, okay, Lord, I guess I'll stay away from those things. There's, and then he describes there's things in the Bible that say these are things that he loves. So we're called to love the things that he loves. And, and, and it's so easy in that sense because all we want to do is please him. And so we live for that. And when we live for that, it's amazing how the rest of life just kind of falls in place. I've seen people pursue after all kinds of stuff, you know, a, a, a profession or a career or, or, or riches, or all, you know, religion, all kinds of stuff, and they're always just running and grasping and just out of reach. But like Matthew 6, 33 says, when you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and you make him that your prime objective, that all these other things have added to you, the other things are things that you wanted it all along, anywhere needed or whatever, and he provides those things, but they don't have the same weight. They don't have the same value. You don't look at it quite the same way. You hold it with a little bit looser grip. 
you know, and, and, and then because Jesus is the main thing. And you, you trust all those things. You hold everything with an open hand. He can put stuff in your hand or it can take stuff out of your hand. But you leave that to him. And you find yourself in that place of contentment. You find yourself in a place of joy and, and, and real peace in life because you're not so anxious about what you're going to get or what you're going to lose. You know, you just live your life for him and, and it works out pretty good. And it's a, it's a love for Jesus Christ as opposed to the law, as opposed to religion or religious observances. We read in 1 Samuel chapter 22, or 15, 22, it says, As the Lord is great at delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. God loves our obedience way over the sacrifices and the work and all that kind of stuff. And so we're called to, to keep our eye on him and to love him first and foremost. In, um, if you will, uh, let's turn to, to the left in your Bible to Acts chapter 19. In Acts chapter 19, it, be, it describes the church in Ephesus and uh, their ministry and the things that they were doing that were actually pretty cool. Uh, in, um, in, in verse 2, Acts chapter 19, verse 2, I'll read it to you real quick. It says, he said to them, uh, and this is Paul now, as he's uh, ministering there uh, in Ephesus. He said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, we have not so much as heard as whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, well, into what then were you baptized? And so they said, well, into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him uh, who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied, and, and there were about 12 and all. And it goes on. And, and so when Paul got to Ephesus, he sensed that something wasn't quite right. You know the old phrase, something's rotten in Denmark. You know, there's just, there was something that just wasn't quite right. And he's kind of trying to put his finger on it, so he asked them a few questions. He said, well, how were you guys baptized? And then we were baptized in John's baptism. Well, John's baptism is really cool, it's just, but it's just the re baptism of repentance. And, and when, when John was baptizing out there by the River Jordan, he was baptizing, you know, all these Jews, basically, that were s repenting of their sins, but they weren't actually praying to receive Jesus. They were just saying, you know, there's, I'm not right. They didn't know what, how to get right. And, and then John the Baptist began to not only baptize them in, in repentance, but pointing to Jesus, behold, the Lamb of God. And so there's a bunch of people that gravitated to Jesus because of John, and I think this is a, a group that's like that. I don't think he was there physically. I think that somebody must have traveled to Israel during the feast days and gone back and whatever, uh, but they were baptized into faith by John the Baptist, but as Paul recognizes that and explains to them what's going on, you read immediately, then they were baptized uh, in Jesus, you know, bat basically baptized in the Holy Spirit. They, they, they knew something was wrong. They recognized it when it was pointed out, and they jumped on, you know, the fix, if you will. And so I like this, that they heard it and they reacted to it. They acted on it. And that's, that's super cool. Now it describes how they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and now they begin to speak in tongues and to prophesy and, you know, utilize the gifts of the Spirit, if you will. But now they're a, what, a Spirit-filled church, if you will. And, it, it, and as it says there, it may have started off with 12 people, but obviously it grew to be pretty big after that. And how God used them. And so the Ephesian church, somewhere along the line, had lost their intensity, their enthusiasm, uh, and their devotion to Christ. They began to lack that close personal relationship, that loving relationship with the Lord. And honestly, that, that's something in ministry that we all have to guard against because you can get so busy on the task at hand, the thing in front of you or the, the, the goal, and even forget why you're doing it. You know, And, and the, the only reason to do any of that stuff is because you love Jesus. Lord, I, I'm doing this to honor you. And yeah, it may impact or help somebody else in a positive way. I hope it does. But the real reason I'm doing this, Lord, is because I want to please you today. And, and we've got to keep that in mind. And so, again, working, in, you know, I've, I've learned this. I, I think that you guys probably learned it along the way as well. Working is not work when you love the one you're working for. You know, when you love Jesus, you may be working hard and sweating like a pig. But you know what? You're, you're, you've got a big old smile on your face. There's times when I, I go to bed 
you know, the old, I, I'm not a cowboy, but I use cowboy saying sometimes. It's like they rode me hard and put me away wet. You know what I mean? They just, uh, man, I had a hard day, and when I, my head hits the pillow, I'm out and gone. But I'm a, I, I'm a smiling because my wife and I will say, this has been a high mileage day. You know, God used us greatly today, and praise the Lord. And you're, you're bone weary and tired from it. You wake up the next day, and you do it again. But you do it in his name for his glory and to please him. And that's the whole point. You know, um, we're told in Galatians 6.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. They've left their first love, but it, 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 it's one of those things that I can't conjure up love sometimes. I mean, I, I would I like to tell you how spiritual I am, how my feet don't usually touch the ground when I walk into the church, and you know I have to put the glowy thing away before I come out because I want to scare you guys. You know, I, I wish I was that spiritual. And there's times when I struggle with how to love people because, you know, sometimes people are difficult. And, uh, you know, and I'm one of the more difficult ones. People have a hard time loving me sometimes. But I don't always have the love. And I say, Lord, I know you've called me to love this person. I, I know, Lord, you've called me to love all people. But I don't have the love. And he goes, it's okay. I got some to spare. I'll give you some of my love you can love them with. And, and that's, that's, in a sense, walking in the Spirit because the fruit of the Spirit is love. And I'll tell you this, loving Jesus is the most spiritual thing you can do. Loving Jesus is the most fruitful thing that you can do. There's lots of spiritual pursuits, but loving Jesus is at the very top of the list. And that's what is important to him when it comes to the church in Ephesus. He's saying, hey, if you lost, you've left your first love. You didn't lose your first love, you left your first love. And we need to guard against that. And again, I would say, you know, as uh, Paul told us in Galatians 5.16, that uh, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. When we're walking in the Spirit, when we're letting the, the fruit of the Spirit flow from our lives and, and our love for Jesus is just that we're loving Him, that's the best fruit of the Spirit. You don't find yourself cussing people out at the, at the drive-thru because they you know, shorted you a, a bag of fries. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, know you, don't, uh, you, you don't go into the flesh the same way because when you're walking in the Spirit, it's the opposite. You deny the lust of the flesh. And when you're loving Jesus supremely in your life, and seeking his face in all things and trying to please him, it's amazing how you can go through this life. And yes, the enemy will try to tempt you. He'll try to stumble you. There'll be things that happen in your life. And you're just going to just shake it off and just keep going because you love Jesus. You're so focused on him. Those things all seem trivial when they happen. I think about when Paul was shipwrecked on Crete and he's building a fire and he grabs a stick and then a snake latches onto his hand and just shakes the snake off and keeps going. Because he was walking in the spirit, and there wasn't anything that was going to hurt him that day because God is just using him in, in, in incredible ways. And I want to be used that way. I want to walk with God that way, and I want to shake all this stuff off. When I get too focused on the stuff, that's when I find myself in the flesh. But when I'm focused on him, man, that's, like I said, loving Jesus is the most spiritual thing that we can do. And as long as we keep doing that, we're doing pretty good. You know, hard work. Uh, is not an acceptable substitute for loving Jesus. You know, when Mary and Martha uh, invited the disciples into their home and Jesus is teaching, and Mar uh, Mary sits down at Jesus' feet, and Martha's working away, sitting, getting the table ready and all that stuff, and she kind of rebuked her sister. Hey, Lord, tell my sister, you know, get off her duff and help me out. And Jesus told her, hey, she's, she's proven that. She's actually chosen the, the better thing. The implication being you should choose that. Because hard work is not a substitute for devotion. And hard work may be what we do, part of the fruit of our, our life with Jesus. But again, it, it comes down to motivation. Why are we doing that hard work? They were commended. They were still doing a lot of good hard work. But they weren't doing it all for the right reason. And Jesus points that out. And he warns them. You know, if you don't straighten up and fly right, I'm going to take, take the church away. I'm going to take the Holy Spirit out. I'm going to remove the lampstand, all these things. They have a sad history. Um, you know, early on, many of the pagan temples were converted uh, to Christian churches because they had all kinds of pagan temples. And so they were converted to Christian churches, but today we're seeing the opposite. More churches are turning into mosques than they are churches. Uh, you know, in England and Europe and stuff, uh, I've seen pictures of churches that are turned into mosques. I've seen pictures that are turned into, you know, businesses and libraries and all kinds of stuff, but no longer functioning as a church. That scares me. I've seen big churches here in our country 
cathedrals with 12 people in them. That's scary to me. I don't want to be that. I want to be very careful. You know, um, part of when, when Ephesus was, was in its heyday, they made these big pillars, four big pillars in front of the church uh, that represented the four Gospels. If you go to Ephesus today, it's the modern city of Izmir in Turkey, and it's in ruins. And one of those, one of those pillars is still standing. All the rest are falling down around it. The buildings are gone. It's like a tourist attraction of ruins, but it's got a cross, you know, carved into it, and it's it's just a sign that there used to be a church here, but it's dead, and it's sad because they didn't take heed to what the Lord said. Typical of many churches in the late apostolic period. Their zeal and faithfulness were still strong, but the warmth of their original love for one another was lost, and their, their love for the Lord was gone as well. Basically, they were kind of going through the motions. I, myself, I, I came out of a religion, and a, a religion where you, my, my kids were amazed. One day, my kids weren't uh, raised in the Catholic Church the way I was, but we took them to Catholic Church one time because of something, uh, a wedding or something like that, and they had a mass before that. So my kids are all sitting there being quiet, you know, which is hard in a squeaky pew. And, uh, and, uh, and I go, hey, watch this. Next they're gonna, everyone's going to stand up. And everybody stood up. And I go, hey, next they're going to kneel down. And everybody kneeled down. Dad, how do you know? And so because every Catholic church everywhere across the planet just about does it the same way, the same routine, the whole thing. And it's very traditional. And, uh, and we've got to be so careful not to fall into the traditional trap of this is just how we do church. And by rote, you know, you kind of keep doing that. Jesus rebuked the religious leaders of his day because they were kind of just going through the motions. They were just kind of giving God lip service, but their hearts were far from him. In, uh, in Mark's gospel, in Mark chapter 7, verses 6 uh, and forward, it says, He answered and said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For the laying aside the commandments of God, you hold the traditions of men, uh, the washing of pitchers and cups and many other such things that you do. And he said to them, all too well, you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. I'm like, whoa. They put a higher value on the word of man than they did the word of God. They had it backwards, and it showed. And this sad testimony can be applied to many churches today, and I'm afraid to many believers as well. And you can have everything going for you. As they, they had a lot of good commendations, but if you don't have love and love for the right reasons, in particular love for Jesus, then it's all a waste of time. Remembering how the Thessalonians were commended. At one point, the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica, and uh, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and your labor of love and your patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God our Father. But do you notice that they, they had that work of faith? I mean, the Ephesians were commended for their work, but it doesn't say work of faith. The Ephesians were commended for their labor, but it wasn't labor of love. The Ephesians were commended for their patience, but it wasn't the patience of hope. And if you don't have faith, hope, and love, what are you? And what were they? And he said, if you don't kind of turn back and, and, and return to these things, that I'm going to take, I'm going to take the candlestick away. I'm going to take the light away. You're on your own. And a church on its own is not a, really a church. It's just a corpse waiting to die the rest of the way. We already covered. Uh, we talked about Revelation chapter four, uh, verse eleven, and we talked about. Uh, uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, about the purpose in life. But when it comes to talking about love, and I want to back up just for a second because I missed something, but, you know, we have to have that faith, hope, and love. And you know the love chapter where Paul describes uh, in 1 Corinthians 13 when he says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I've become like sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Now, if somebody comes in here while we're talking or having a Bible study and they just start banging away at a cymbal, Besides being an interruption, it'd be annoying. I mean, every little kid a couple of days ago got some electronic little toy uh, filled with batteries, and you push a button, and the siren goes off, and it makes noise, and after, and it's cute for the first three tenths of a second or so, 
but you know, it's funny how uh, December 25th, all those little things are running around making noise. December 26th, the batteries all got lost. I'm not sure what happened. <laughs> Because some of those things can be pretty <laughs> annoying at times. Because the little kids think it's awesome. <laughs> all over the house. They never get tired of it. But some of us <laughs> do get a little like, hey, I've heard that before. Thank you. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's awesome. And we don't want to be like that. You know, without love, the things that we say, the things that we do are irritating. And it goes on and says, although we, I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, but I, I have not love, I'm nothing. And though I give my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. I can, I can work around the church, and I can build stuff, and, 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 and you know, do all kinds of things, ostensibly in the name of Jesus, but without love, and particularly love for Jesus Christ, it's worthless. It has to be done the right way on his terms. And that's what he's calling the Ephesian church back to. Because they've kind of lost sight of that. They've, you know, they're so busy and, and doing so many good things, they've lost, they've lost track of that. As I mentioned a minute ago, uh, we went over Revelation 4.11, talking about the purpose of life, and Colossians 1.16, the same thing, that you know, we exist to please God. But part of that pleasing God, the process is that we're called to have fellowship with him. You know, he created us to have fellowship with him because that would be pleasing to him. But to have fellowship with him, we can't have sin in our lives. We've got to be cleansed from that. And that's why his son Jesus, you know, died in our, in our place. But the whole point of all that is that God wants to have communion or koinonia or fellowship with us. And, you know, you go back to Exodus, you know, I want to, I want to be in the middle of your camp. You know, you go throughout the Bible, and the common thread is that God wants to be with his people. He wants his people to be with him. We were created to please God, but in the process, we were created to have fellowship with God. In, uh, in 1 Corinthians 1, nine, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. We were created to have a close, loving, personal relationship with him. In fact, we're studying through 1 John on Wednesday nights. And in uh, 1 John 1, 3, it says uh, that Jesus was manifested. He was real. But then he goes on to say that you may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We were created to have fellowship with him, to be pleasing in his sight. And I'll just say that Christ has to be the most important love, the most important thing in our lives. And our relationship with him has to be the, 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 the closest of anything. That he may have, as, as Paul puts it to the Colossians, that he may have the preeminence in all things. And you know what? I, I got to be, I got to be straight up with you. It's not so that he would just, you know, inch ahead and be the most important thing. That he would have, he would be the most important thing by a mile, by a big distance. Again, back to the relationships of, in comparison, we have to hate father, mother, husband, wife, children, all those kinds of things, and compared to our love for him, it's not just a squeaker. You know, okay, just got him above. No, it's got to be supreme. And so we're, we're called to love him and let him be preeminent in our lives. And then he says in verse 5, that, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and, and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. So I get three things out of this. I, the word remember, the word repent, and then the word do. You know, remember, repent, and then do the first works. Remember where you started. You know, the Ephesians started out pretty good. And, you know, they were spreading the gospel all over Asia. And then something happened. Something, you know, began to slip. They weren't quite as passionate, whatever. And uh, they slipped from where they started out. They started out being filled with the Spirit and prophesying and all kinds of stuff. And where they end up, a bunch of rubble in Turkey, you know, and you don't want to be that. So he says, repent. Understand Again, he's telling Christians to repent. I'm used to telling pagans to repent, telling non-believers to repent. But now he's telling Christians to repent. Why? Why would God tell them to repent? They're Christians. Because when you're moving to God, he's not going to tell you to repent because you're going in the right direction. He wants you to keep coming. He wants you to draw closer. If you draw close to me, I'll, I'll draw close to you. 
If he's telling them to repent, it's because whether they know it or not, they're going the wrong way. And they need help figuring that out, apparently. And so Jesus writes them this letter, and he sends the Holy Spirit a bunch of stuff. But when he says repent, the intent was that in, in repentance, that instead of moving away from God, they would then be moving to God. And that's the whole point. He wants that closer, deeper, more personal, intimate relationship. He doesn't want us to have a distant relationship. And so he's, they're told to repent, to turn back to God. Do what you did in the beginning. But if you don't, I'm going to remove your lampstand. If there's no light at the top, the Holy Spirit's the light, Jesus is the lampstand. If there's no light at the top, why bother with a lampstand? So he's going to remove it. He's not going to hang out in a dead church. And that's why a church is dead, by the way, because Jesus removes himself from it. And so he won't be a part of a church where he's not the center of it, being led by the Holy Spirit. And we've already been told, he's already told us in the Gospels, you can't do it without me anyway. I, I'm not going to point fingers, but there are churches out there that are trying to do church without Jesus. There are churches out there that are trying to do church without the Bible. They, they, in fact, they say Jesus isn't God. The Bible's not true. They, they blaspheme that way. And they still call themselves a church. And I just scratch my head. I mean, I know there's atheists out there and there's agnostics and there's all kinds of you know, knuckleheads that, that claim all kinds of stuff. But why would you call yourself a church when you deny Christ? It's like atheists that celebrate Christmas. Oxymoron. <laughs> you know, if you don't believe in God, I just want presents. Ah, okay. You know, you just want what you want. But Jesus told us in John chapter 15, verse 5, he said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing, including be a church. And so, you know, and Ephesus has kind of a sad history. Uh, back in 431 AD, uh, Emperor Theodosius, now you've all heard of Emperor Nero and Emperor Augustus and you know, some of the Caesars and stuff, but hardly anybody's ever heard of Emperor Theodosius. And uh, Emperor Constantine uh, was one of the guys that uh, kind of sanctioned Christianity at one point, became a Christian. But Emperor Theodosius, the Roman emperor, was the first emperor to uh, demand uh, that all Romans become Christians. And really kind of, that was the beginning of really of the, the Catholic Church in a sense. But Emperor Theodosius held a council of churches at Ephesus, in the church in Ephesus. And they had 200 bishops show up. And at the end of their council, they affirmed that Mary is the mother of God. Now, you heard what I said? I didn't say Mary is the mother of Jesus. They affirmed that Mary is the mother of God. And the emphasis went from revering Jesus to revering Mary. You guys get it? The focus changed. Jesus warned them, return to your first love. And they go, nah, we're going this way, <laughs> sadly. And that's why the place is a wreck even today. And so uh, affirm Mary as the mother of God versus Jesus. This became the heretical doctrine uh, with the focus now shifting to Mary as opposed to Jesus. Christ was calling the Ephesian church to repentance, to turn back and to rise up to their first level of love and devotion uh, to our Lord. And if not, the day would inevitably come when the angel of the church of Ephesus would be withdrawn or removed and Christ would no longer be in their midst. And I think this warning applies to every church and I think even to every Christian that Jesus has to be supreme. And, and that's the lesson that we can learn. When you leave Christ, there's no way to go but down. You guys have heard that term backsliding? It typically, you know, when it, there's a Christian that's, you know, backsliding means they're not, they're not, you know, living for him the way they were. They're falling away from the faith or whatever. Falling away, that's down. But, you know, backsliding doesn't happen on level ground. <laughs> Sliding always happens on an incline. Away, down, lower. And so we want to avoid that. The bottom line is that we, that, that we will be removed from his presence. He's not going to hang around with the church uh, that he's not the center of attention because it's all about him. Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It's written of me. Now, in um, verse 6, it says, But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And so there's another commendation here. And I think I mentioned last week about the sandwich 
technique that some supervisors are using. They, they compliment you, they, 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 you're doing these things right, that's really good. Then they go, nevertheless, here's the thing we gotta work on, the thing you need to improve on or whatever. Then, they, then they'll add another thing at the end, like, oh, but this is another thing you're doing good too. So hopefully you walk away with a positive experience, you know, like every good supervisor wants, and, and then every employee responds appropriately and skips out of the room and does the right thing. That's what I always did. But anyway, <laughs> but the idea here is that he's, he's giving them another commendation, which I think is pretty cool. This much you do right. And, uh, you know, he, he, but he says, I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. The thing you learn as you walk with the Lord for any time is that you figure out as you read the Bible the things that God likes. If God likes something, then that's the thing that we do. If God doesn't like something, that this is rocket science. If God doesn't like it, then we go, I'm not going to do that. And if God loves something or someone, then we're supposed to love that something or someone. God loves everybody, so we're called to love everybody. But on the rare occasion when God says, I hate that, then we hate it too, don't we? Well, notice it says, I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. It didn't say I hated the Nicolaitans. That's a, an important distinction to make. But hate is a strong word. Ours is supposed to be the God of love. You know, he, he's the God of love. But then now we read that he hates something. And hate is not like one of these ambivalent, mamby-pamby, middle-of-the-road kind of words. The word for hate here is missio in Greek. And it means to hate, to, an act of ill will in word and conduct, specifically the opposite of love, so, uh, specifically the opposite of agape or phileo, it means to detest or to abhor. And God says he hates the deeds of the Nicolaitans. It's like, whoa, this is not a, a middle road statement. And, I, you know, from Romans chapter 8, verse 31, Paul writes, if God is for us, who can be against us? But I want to just say the opposite is true as well. If God is against you, who can be for you? And for God to have an act of ill will towards <laughs> this group of people that are doing these things, that's not a good thing. It's like going to war with God. And uh, you, what you find out when you go to war with God is that your arms are too short. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work. And so God's saying he hates these things. The, the question I have in my mind is, well, then who are the Nicolaitans? I want to avoid these guys like the plague, you know. And... uh. And the, 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 the name or the, the title Nicolaitans is a compound word. The first part is Nico, or like Nike means, you know, conquer. And so uh, to conquer, to overcome, sometimes referred to as the, the priesthood. But the Laetans is the, the word comes from the word Laos or laity, which means people. So the Nicolaitans were the conquerors of the people. People were conquered. And, uh, and that's doesn't sound like a good thing. Uh, the next question is, well, who are the Nicolaitans? And all I can tell you is I don't really know. Uh, nobody really knows. I can give you some possibilities, and I'm going to throw a few out, uh, but we don't know for sure. Uh, the Nicolaitans may have been a people whose doctrines were similar to that of Balaam, uh, whose influence caused the Israelites to eat meat, sacrifice to idols, and to commit fornication. When I say fornication, I mean... Uh, physical fornication and spiritual fornication. Uh, God hates both, but he lumps them into one word, fornication. We all, our minds go to physical fornication, but from God's viewpoint, fornication is when we love and serve and worship anything besides himself. So all the pagan deities out there, all the different things, your car, uh, your favorite toy or whatever, if you love that more than him, then that's spiritual adultery or fornication and he's saying that these this is a group of people out there that caused my people to commit fornication and he's thinking physical and spiritual and he taught the people to sin the people were literally overcome by sin remember uh, Balaam was a, a, a prophet a diviner uh, that King Balak attempted to employ because he saw the children of Israel coming into his land and he goes whoa I saw what they did in Egypt and everything else. I don't want that in my, my land. So uh, he wants to hire Balak, I'm sorry, Balaam to curse them. And this is recorded in uh, Deuteronomy 23.4, Numbers 22 and forward. And basically, uh, 
Balaam said, you know, I, I can't curse him because God's blessed him. How can I curse something that God's blessed? And he made it a couple of attempts, and it didn't work. And then finally, uh, because Balaam wanted the money from Balak, he goes, well, I can't curse them, but I can teach you how to do some stuff where they'll bring a curse upon themselves. Here's what you do. You send all your young women with their idols and stuff down into their camp. Uh, they'll basically kind of prostitute themselves uh, with the, the Hebrew men. And as they engage in uh, spiritual and physical fornication, they will actually bring judgment upon themselves from God. And so you kind of trick the people, if you will, into that. And so some think that the, the, the Nicolaitans may be a group that's kind of like this, intentionally leading God's people astray. And there are so many people trying to do that today, trying to lead God's people astray. Uh, second possibility, uh, a group named after a guy by the name of Nicholas of Antioch, who formed an agnostic cult, uh, which taught, amongst other things, that one must indulge in sin to understand it. <laughs> Sounds kind of self-serving, huh? You know, it's like, ah, I wonder what it's like to get your head run over by a truck. Let me go lay down in the street and find out. You know, <laughs> it's like dumb, but uh, but that's what they taught, and. Um, uh, uh, they gave themselves over to sensuality uh, with the explanation that such sins did not touch or involve the spirit and therefore didn't concern God. Uh, Rongo Dongo. Um, they also set up an ecclesiastical order, a hierarchy of priests and bishops and archbishops and cardinals and popes, uh, teaching the laity, the people, to depend on men as opposed to depending on an abiding relationship in Christ Jesus. Uh, they claimed divine authority over the people, placing a clergy class between God and man. And God hates that. That's the essence of religion because he wants us to have that personal relationship with him. You know, um, um, the, the Nicolaitans may have been uh, simply a, a group of false or pseudo uh, apostles or teachers or whatever, uh, you know, false Christ and stuff, because Jesus warned us about that, didn't he? He said these kind of people would come. All three groups did exist at that time. In fact, Paul writes uh, to the Corinthians, uh, for such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. And so we see that. Remember one of the commendations that the Ephesians were given in verse 2, it says, you've tested those who say they are apostles and not, and have found them liars. So they were good at, you know, finding these people out. And so they dealt with that. That's a combination. They, they, they dealt with these Nicolaitan guys. You know, um, one of the tests, I think, in, uh, in, uh, in Timothy and Titus, it, it lists the qualifications of uh, bishops and elders and stuff, and leaders in the church. And it goes through a pretty good list of things. But another attribute or another qualification that, isn't as well known, but it's easy to see. Uh, Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 20, verse 26, uh, he said, am I in the right place? Uh, all right. Uh, in Matthew chapter 20, verse 26, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And the word minister means literally servant. He says, whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. These Nicolaitans would come in, and I assume want to assume authority over people, and so when it's time to clean up after the church potluck, or it's time to, you know, a work day at church or whatever, they're the guys that would stand around with a cup of coffee and watch everybody else work. Because they're, they're not servants. They're, they just want power. They want something else. And so it's not that hard to figure out, you know, who they are, and, and they did, and to their credit. In any priesthood where there's a spiritual hierarchy over the people, uh, in our minds, that puts some men closer to God than others. And I would say in some ignorant minds, people that are not well-versed in Scripture, you know, when they see a priest or they see a pastor or they see different people, oh, they're much closer to God. I mean, they're, they, you know, they're on a pedestal, whatever. And that's a great mistake because I can tell you from my own personal experience, you know, I have stumbled and fumbled and bumbled around like any other knucklehead Christian that's out there. Uh, and we've all seen pastors fall from, you know, different things. And so putting any man on a pedestal that way is, I think, the wrong thing. 
There, there needs to be nobody between you personally and Jesus Christ. You know, maybe a pastor will point you to him. Maybe he'll lead by example. Different things, hopefully, they'd be a good example. But, you know, like Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. But if I'm not following Christ, don't follow me. And so there was this group of people that were trying to claim that kind of authority and, and status. Because Jesus died on the cross that we could come directly to God through him. There, there need not be any man that would be in that role. That's why he said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. And so that's what we're called to. He doesn't want anyone standing in the way. He died again to give us access to the throne of God himself. And that's why the curtain was torn. That's why you read after Jesus' crucifixion, when, he's, when he yielded up the spirit, the temple the curtain in the temple that separated the, the holy place from the holy of holies. The throne room of God was torn from the top to the bottom. That must mean there was <coughs> a little thread hanging or, or something where it's still together at the very bottom where you can tell it went from the top to the bottom. But I mean, the idea was that now man has access to God. But that access is granted to us through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the idea here is, and what I want to kind of impress on you guys, is that you know the truth. And knowing the truth prepares you to deal with the many lies and the disinformation that's out there. That's why I encourage you to read your Bible, study your Bibles, come to church, hear the Bible studies, listen to the radio station, all those different things that are going to build up your mind and your heart in Christ Jesus, that you're going to be saturated with the truth. So that when the lies come, it just bounces off because you know better. Jesus taught his disciples in, in John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, he said, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, I know in context, it's, the truth will set you free from, from sin and death, and that's true. But being equipped or armed with the truth will also equip you to deal with the lies because you'll recognize them as what they are, lies. And so that's why we study our Bible. That's why as we study about the church in Ephesus, we try to learn those lessons that the, the Holy Spirit was teaching to the, the church in, in Ephesus. But, you know, these letters are not just, for, this letter was not just for the Ephesians. This is one big letter that went to all seven of those churches. And then it's come to us. So there's so much that we can glean from this. But the, the biggest lesson, you know, that the, the, the biggest rebuke or admonition, if you want to take it that way, is he says, you've left your first love. And so we want to be so careful uh, not to do that. And the other thing that Jesus told us was, do this in remembrance of me. And if you're re remembering Jesus, if you're conscious of his presence, if you're fully aware of, of where you're at in relation to him, and you're kind of keeping tabs on that through your life, you don't have to worry about backsliding. You don't have to worry about being you know, distanced from him. Because when you abide in him and you're in his presence, it's pretty hard not to keep him as the focus of your life. And when he is the focus of your life, he is the love of your life, then you remember him with joy. And you look forward to those opportunities like we're going to have in just a moment to have communion together and to remember what he's done for us. I want to invite the worship team uh, to come on up. But the truth is that Jesus came to pay the price for our sins so that we could have uninterrupted fellowship with him here on earth and in heaven. And I, I love the Christian life. I've lived the other kind of life and a lot of sorrow and stress and all kinds of stuff. Not that I don't have things to deal with in my Christian life, but the Christian life is so much better than the worldly life. And I tell you what, when it comes to eternity, that's the choices. Eternity with him or eternity separated from him. And I want to do everything I can to stoke the flames in my heart for my Lord Jesus. I want to rem remember him always. Every day, every thought, every step, everything I'm doing, I want to be thinking about him. And communion is a great way to do that. It's, a, it's a, like a little bit of a Christian reset. And, you know, Paul gave an admonition that every time uh, we read about it anyway in, in Corinthians, that when he gave this admonition, he says, you know, communion is for believers. It's not for non-believers. Because what, what would a non-believer celebrate? What are they remembering? Nothing. And 
So it's not for non-believers because if you even if a non-believer takes communion, it's to their own peril. He says many sleep or die. You know, many get sick, all kinds of stuff. Now, what I would say is, if you're listening on the radio or on Facebook, it's easy to fix that. I mean, you can pray a prayer, say, "Lord Jesus, come into my heart, forgive me for my sins, and come into my heart, and be my Lord and Savior." And I acknowledge that you died for me and that you rose again. I believe that you rose again. And the Bible says, if you believe that in your heart, confess it with your lips, you shall be saved. So it's an easy thing to fix. But even as, as, as believers, when we come to the communion table, he says, uh, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And so as a believer, maybe... Like I said, I've, I've had to pray and repent and ask God to forgive me of all kinds of stuff on the way to church. <laughs> and and maybe there's maybe that's you today. I don't know. Maybe you're dealing with something. But you're going to have a few minutes while we distribute the elements and uh, and have an opportunity uh, to, you know, make it right with God if you need to. And if not, then praise God. But uh, you'll have a moment or two to reflect on that as we pass out the elements. Hey, yeah, uh, Luke Shahana, would you help me pass out the elements, please? Thank you. The piece of bread that you hold in your hands represents the body of our Lord Jesus that was uh, broken for us. He was beaten. He was scourged. Uh, eventually, he was pierced with those nails. And he bled and died for each of us. And this little piece of bread represents his sacrifice for us. And as we, as we eat it, you know, we chew it up. We swallow it. It goes into our stomach, and it's, it's, it's distributed throughout our entire body. And like Jesus, he's intended that we would partake of him, that he would permeate every part of our body and of our life. And so we remember his sacrifice for us. We remember the, the pain and the agony that he went through being separated from the Father. We remember the physical pain that he went through, and by his stripes we are healed, and we're glad. He is the living bread of life that came down from heaven. And if we partake of that, he says we will live forever. The Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this 
in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. Treasure of heaven, crucified. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. The cup that you hold in your hands, uh, filled with grape juice, represents the blood of our Lord Jesus that was shed for us. That blood that poured from his head with the crown of thorns, from his face, from the beating, Lord, his back that was scourged and torn up, um, from his side, when that that his side was pierced, his heart was broken. That same blood that runs down the cross and into our hearts and into our lives and cleanses us from all sin. His blood is sufficient to cleanse from all sin. That's why he said on the cross, it is finished, it is done. It is paid in full. There's nothing left to do but to trust in him. We're told in the Old Testament that the life of the flesh is in the blood and he's given it to us upon the altar to make an atonement for our souls For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. And that's what he did for us. He sacrificed himself. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We remember him on his terms. Let's partake together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you, Lord, that our names are written in your book of life because of what you've done for us. We praise your holy name and we rejoice in you. Thank you, Lord. We remember you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's, if you're able, let's stand together for our last song.
Gracious Father, we thank you that, Lord, you, you saw our need way long off, Lord, before we were born, before we saw our need. And yet, Lord, you sent your son to meet that need and to pay the price. And we thank you for that. Help us, Lord, to learn the lessons of the Ephesian church. Lord, to, to have endurance and to, to continue in the good work that you've put before us. But, Lord, to keep our minds steadfast and focused on you and loving you for what an awesome God you are. We remember you today, Father. Pray that you'd be glorified in this place and in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you guys. The Lord bless thee. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. And keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee. And be gracious unto thee. And be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up. The Lord lift up. His countenance. His countenance. Upon thee. And give thee peace. Well, God bless you guys. I pray that you have just a restful, peaceful day. I pray the Lord continues to speak to your hearts and that you keep your eyes on him. That as you keep your eyes on him, you've got to just put a big old smile on your face, knowing that his face is smiling right back at you. God bless you guys. Have a great day. If you need uh, prayer for any reason, come on up. Myself and the elders, we'd love to pray with you. Have a good day.